Lord is risen. Hallelujah. A few things to uh, say today. First of all, happy Mother's Day. And uh, there are flowers that are lining the windowsills. Please, moms, uh, feel free to take them on your way out today and enjoy them. Um, also, I know there's been geraniums for sale uh, this week and next week also. Those are the ones that we, we plant out in the churchyard or take home on Pentecost Sunday. Represent the love of God spreading out into the world. Uh, this coming Saturday, May 20th, is cleanup day. So if you'd like to lend a hand with our outdoor cleanup work, uh, please come. They get started early, I think at 8, 8 a.m. And our Boy Scouts are helping to, to lead that project. Also, there's a wonderful project that's been ongoing here at Zion for several years. It's called, uh, it's called uh, Operation Linus, I believe. And it's, it, is, uh, it is the, the project where folks of our congregation are making blankets that go to hospitalized children. And it's been very successful here. And uh, they've started to do a fellowship day, a blanket making day, uh, once a month. And so that's going to happen next Sunday, May 21st. Details are in the bulletin. Also, this coming week, uh, Monday the 15th through Sunday the 21st, I will be on vacation. And uh, authorized lay worship leader Mark Giesen will be here to uh, to preach and preside to lead you in worship. He always does a wonderful job. He cares uh, very much for the people of this congregation. And if you have any pastoral emergencies, you can call either Pastor Mitternacht or uh, Pastor Justin Lingenfelter, and their uh, phone numbers are listed in your bulletin. I'm going to be away at my children's uh, graduations, and uh, I'll just tell you about those uh, very briefly. Uh, Noah is graduating from Klein School of Law at Drexel uh, University in Philadelphia, and he's got a job awaiting him at McNerney, Page, Vanderlyn, and Hall. And Grace is graduating from uh, Grove City College with a teaching degree, and she's going to be going to a job at St. John's Lutheran Church in Shiremanstown, outside of Harrisburg. Uh, she'll be serving as their uh, director of youth and family ministry. And so uh, I will be away this week enjoying my family. Are there any other announcements that need to be made? If not, then we'll begin with our entrance and please stand.
Hallelujah. Christ is risen. The grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, the love of God, the communion of the Holy Spirit be with you all. God, from whom all good things come, lead us by the inspiration of your spirit to think those things which are right, and by your goodness help us to do them, through your Son, Jesus Christ our Lord, who lives and reigns with you in the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. Amen. A reading from Acts. Paul stood in front of the Areopagus and said, Athenians, I see how extremely religious you are in every way. For as I went through the city and looked carefully at the objects of your worship, I found among them an altar with the inscription to an unknown God. What therefore you worship as unknown, this I proclaim to you. The God who made the world and everything in it he who is Lord of heaven and earth does not live in shrines made by human hands, nor is he served by human hands as though he needed anything, since he himself gives to all mortals life and breath and all things. From one ancestor he made all nations to inhabit the whole earth, and he allotted the times of their existence and the boundaries of the place, places where they would live so that they would search for God and perhaps grope for him and find him. 
though indeed he is not far from each one of us. For in him we live and move and have our being, as even some of your own poets have said, for we too are his offspring. Since we are God's offspring, we ought not to think that the deity is like gold or silver or stone, an image formed by the art and imagination of mortals. While God has overlooked the times of human ignorance, now he commands all people everywhere to repent, because he has fixed a day on which we, he, he will have the world judged in righteousness by a man whom he has appointed, and of this he has given assurance to all by raise, raising him from the dead. The word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Peter, who will harm you if you are eager to do what is good? But even if you do suffer for doing what is right, you are blessed. Do not fear what they fear, and do not be intimidated. But in your heart, sanctify Christ as Lord. Always be ready to make your defense to anyone who demands from you an accounting for the hope that is in you. Yet do it with gentleness and reverence. Keep your conscience clear so that, when you are maligned, those who have used you for your good conduct in Christ may be put to shame. For it is better to suffer for doing good, if, su if suffering should be God's will, than to suffer for doing evil. For Christ also suffered for sins since once for all, the righteous for the unrighteous, in order to bring you to God. He was put to death in the flesh, but made alive in the spirit, in which also he went and made a proclamation to the spirits in prison, who in former times did not obey, when God waited patiently in the days of Noah, during the building of the ark, in which a few, that is, eight persons, were saved through water. And baptism, which this prefigured, now saves you, 
not as a removal of dirt from the body, but as an appeal to God for a good conscience through the resurrection of Jesus Christ, who has gone into heaven and is at the right hand of God with angels, authorities, and powers made subject to him. The word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Gospel according to St. John, the 14th chapter. Glory to you, O Lord. Jesus said to the disciples, If you love me, you will keep my commandments, and I will ask the Father, and he will give you another advocate to be with you forever. This is the Spirit of truth, whom the world cannot receive, because it neither sees him nor knows him. You know him because he abides with you, and he will be with you. I will not leave you orphaned. I am coming to you. In a little while the world will no longer see me, but you will see me. Because I live, you also will live. On that day you will know that I am in my Father, and you in me, and I in you. They who have my commandments and keep them, are those who love me. And those who love me will be loved by my Father, and I will love them and reveal myself to them. The Gospel of the Lord. Praise to you, O Christ. In the name of God the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. Amen. When do you feel most loved? That's the essence of the teaching of Christian counselor Gary Chapman. Through his many years of experience uh, as a marriage and family counselor, he was able to recognize that people all seem to have a particular love language. That is, people seem to give and receive love in five primary ways. Ways in which they feel most loved. Those ways are words of affirmation, quality time, giving and receiving gifts, acts of service, and physical touch. Some of you may recall us going through the five love languages about a dozen years ago during midweek Latin studies. Well, in his 1992 book, The Five Love Languages, Chapman states that God created all of us with what we might call an emotional love tank on the inside. When other people communicate their love to us, in our primary love language, then our love tank gets filled up. We have the emotional energy to, to face the challenges of life and relationship. When those around us fail to communicate love in the way we naturally prefer to receive it, our love tank is depleted, and so is that energy. So, again, when do you feel most loved? Here's a quick summary of the five love languages. Which one do you most associate with? Words of affirmation. Some folks feel most love when love is expressed verbally. Receiving genuine compliments or words of appreciation, that means the world to them. Quality time. These people feel loved when their friends and family members share their full, undivided attention with them. What you do is not as important as the fact that time is shared doing it together. The giving and receiving of gifts. If this is a person's primary love language, receiving a gift is a visual symbol of love. The gift needn't be large or expensive, but it's a way of saying, I'm thinking about you and I value you. There's acts of service. These people feel loved when they are helped by others. The small sacrifices of time and effort on the part of others mean so much to them. And then finally, physical touch. If this is a person's primary love language, they like to give and receive appropriate signs of affection, such as shaking hands, a kiss on the cheek, or a warm embrace. 
Now, the concept of the five love languages has become very popular in the past 30 years. It can be helpful in realizing how family members and friends are built to give and to receive love. And it certainly helps a person answer the question, when do I feel most loved? Yet, I have another question for you today. What makes God feel loved? What's God's language of affection? Now, that may seem a little odd to ask. After all, can't God look into the depths of the human heart and see if genuine love for him resides there? What possible test could God need to prove the sincerity of our affection? Well, maybe none, but there is a way for us to know the answer to the question, a way for us to understand the depth of our love for God. Jesus addresses these very things in today's gospel passage from John. Jesus says to his disciples, If you love me, you will keep my commandments. And then a bit later he says, They who have my commandments and keep them are those who love me. In other words, God's love language is obedience. Obedience to his commands. Jesus, the Son of God, was the, the perfect example of how uh, to love God and obey God completely. God made it very clear that his focus was on obeying his Father only. In John's Gospel, he said, I do as the Father has commanded me, so that the world may know that I love the Father. As a young boy, Jesus chose to obey his Father in heaven instead of following the crowd. We know that when he was 12 years old, Jesus traveled to Jerusalem with Mary and Joseph and extended family. On the return trip home, they realized Jesus was no longer with them. Turning back to Jerusalem, they eventually found him in the temple, teaching the teachers. He claimed that he, he had to be about his father's business. Jesus chose obedience when he went to be baptized by John in the Jordan River, saying that it was necessary to fulfill the scriptures. Later, Jesus suffered and chose obedience when he was tempted by Satan in the wilderness, he chose the path of obedience to the Father by thwarting the devil's temptations with Scripture. As he struggled in the Garden of Gethsemane over his impending crucifixion, he once again said yes to the Father. Father, if you are willing, please take this cup of suffering away from me, but not my will, but your will be done. After learning to trust and obey his father in small trials, Jesus was able to trust and obey his father in his biggest trial. In Philippians, the Apostle Paul writes, Let the same mind be in you that was in Christ Jesus, who, though he was in the form of God, did not regard equality with God as something to be exploited, but emptied himself, taking the form of a slave, being born in human likeness. And being found in human form, he humbled himself and became obedient to the point of death, even death on a cross. Jesus is our example of obedience, and he calls us to obey him completely. Obedience is his love language. And this is why he says in the passage of John before us today, If you love me, you will keep my commandments. It's also helpful to remember the context of these words of Jesus. This is his last night with his disciples before his crucifixion. And during supper with them, Jesus kneels before his disciples and he washes their feet, a servant's task. And he explains his actions by telling them, If I, your Lord and teacher, have washed your feet, you also ought to wash one another's feet. In other words, serve one another. Jesus also goes on to say, I give you a new commandment, to love one another. Just as I have loved you, you also should love one another. By this, everyone will know that you are my disciples, if you have love for one another. Jesus is saying here, I have loved you by serving you, now you go, and you serve other people, and then they will know that you are my followers. So this is his commandment to his disciples, and it's really his commandment to us as well. When we obey this commandment to love other people by serving them, we're speaking God's love language. 
It's important that we obediently follow Jesus' command because the way that this world will know that the Creator God loves them is by God's love flowing through us in our service to others. We know the love of God through Jesus Christ, and we want the world to be able to see that love reflected in us. But are we being obedient? Are we a true mirror to our master, Jesus? I remember when my son Noah was in middle school, and he had a teacher that he really liked. He said that this teacher was very interesting in class, and he talked with Noah about Star Wars because he too was a fan of all things Star Wars. To Noah's mind, he was an awesome teacher. The day of the seventh grade field trip to Knobles, Noah was again telling me how awesome this teacher was, how he rode the rides with the students, even the ones that went upside down. After a while of expressing his admiration for this teacher, Noah said to me, you're a bit like him, Dad. And I thought, well, I want to pursue this. How am I like him, Noah? Noah replied, well, he's kind of bald, too. (laughs) then I said did you have anything else in mind when you said I was like him and Noah said no dad sorry not really (laughs) the reason I tell this story is to get you to think in what ways am I reflecting Jesus in my life what do I have in common with Jesus that other people can look at me and be reminded of Jesus Hopefully, you will do better than I do at reflecting the awesomeness of a favorite teacher. What I mean is, does someone look at us and say, you remind me of Jesus, you wear sandals too? Or does someone look at us and say, you remind me of Jesus, you love people and you care for people and you serve people? Now, the truth is, it is often hard to love and serve people. Some folks can be difficult to love. Their behavior leaves much to be desired. But the simple command of Jesus is love them anyway. Seek their well-being. Serve them as you have opportunity. Now, this doesn't mean that you have to serve someone else's selfishness. But in any way, you can genuinely reflect the love of God into their lives. We are commanded to do so. No matter how messy of a disciple we may be, When we genuinely want to grow more, Jesus will show up in our life and help us to live out this love language of obedience. Michael Iaconelli, in his book, Messy Spirituality, tells the story of Daryl. Every month, the youth group at River Road Church visited a local nursing home to hold church services for the residents. Daryl, a reluctant youth group volunteer, did not like nursing homes. For a long time, he had avoided the monthly services. But when a flu epidemic depleted the group of sponsors, Daryl agreed to help with the next month's service, as long as he did not have to be part of the program. During the service, Daryl felt awkward and out of place. He leaned against the back wall between two residents in wheelchairs. Just as the service finished and Daryl was thinking about a quick exit, someone grabbed his hand. Startled, he looked down and saw a very old, frail, and obviously lonely man in the wheelchair. What could Daryl do but hold the man's hand? The man's mouth hung open and his face held no expression. Daryl doubted whether he could hear or see anything. As everyone began to leave, Daryl realized he didn't want to leave the old man. Daryl had been left too many times in his own life. Caught someone off guard by his feelings, he leaned over and whispered, I'm sorry, I have to leave, but I'll be back, I promise. And without warning, the man squeezed Daryl's hand and then let it go. As Daryl's eyes filled with tears, he grabbed his stuff and started to leave. Inexplicably, he heard himself say to the old man, I love you. And he thought, where did that come from? What's the matter with me? Well, Daryl returned the next month. And the month after that, each time it was the same. Daryl would stand in the back and Oliver would grab his hand. Daryl would say he had to leave. And Oliver would squeeze his hand and Daryl would say softly, I love you, Mr. Leak. Obviously, he'd learned his name by then, Oliver Leak. As the months went on, 
about a week before the next service, Daryl would find himself looking forward to visiting his aged friend. On Daryl's sixth visit, the service started, but Oliver still hadn't been wheeled out. Daryl didn't seem you know, too concerned at first, but it, because it often took the nurses a long time to wheel everyone into that worship room. But halfway into the service, Daryl became alarmed. He went to the head nurse. Um, I don't see Mr. Leek here today. Is he okay? The nurse asked Daryl to follow her, and she led him to his room. Oliver lay in his bed, his eyes closed, closed and his breathing uneven. At 40 years of age, Daryl had never seen someone dying, but he knew that Oliver was near death. Slowly, he walked to the side of the bed and grabbed Oliver's hand. When Oliver didn't respond, tears filled Daryl's eyes. He knew he might never see Oliver alive again. He had so much he wanted to say, but the words wouldn't come out. He stayed with Oliver for about an hour until the youth director gently interrupted to say that they were leaving. Daryl stood and squeezed Mr. Leake's hand for the last time. I'm sorry, Oliver. I have to go. I love you. As he unclasped his hand, he felt a squeeze. Mr. Leake had responded. He had squeezed Daryl's hand. The tears were unstoppable now, and Daryl stumbled toward the door, trying to regain his composure. A young woman was standing at the door. Daryl almost bumped into her. Oh, I'm sorry, he said, I didn't see you. It's all right. I've been wanting to say you, to see you, she said. I'm Oliver's granddaughter. He's dying, you know. Yes, I know. I wanted to meet you, she said. When the doctor said he was dying, I came immediately. We've always been very close, but they said he couldn't talk. But he's been talking with me. Not much, but I know what he is saying. Last night he woke up. His eyes were bright and alert. He looked straight into my eyes and said, please say goodbye to Jesus for me. And he laid back down and closed his eyes. He caught me off guard, and as soon as I gathered my composure, I whispered, Grandpa, I don't need to say goodbye to Jesus. You're going to be with him soon, soon, and you can say hello. Grandpa struggled to open his eyes again, and this time his face lit up with a smile, and he said, as clearly as I'm talking to you now, I know, but Jesus comes to see me every month, and he might not know I've gone. He closed his eyes, and he hasn't spoken since. I told the nurse what he'd said, and she told me about you coming every month, holding Grandpa's hand. I want to thank you for him. And well, I never thought of Jesus as being as chubby and bald as you, but I imagine that Jesus is very glad to have had you be mistaken for him. I know Grandpa is. Thank you. And she leaned over and kissed Daryl on the forehead. Oliver Leake died peacefully the next morning. If a reluctant follower like Daryl can be mistaken for Jesus, maybe you and I can too. May Jesus teach us to speak his love language of obedience. Amen.
God has made us his people through our baptism into Jesus Christ, living together in trust and hope, we confess the creed. pray for the whole people of God in Christ Jesus, for all people according to their needs. Eternal God, we give you thanks for this day of worship. Guide us by your Holy Spirit when life is troubled and when life is calm. Keep us always strong to do your will, to be obedient to you. Lord, in your mercy, be present with the church on earth, that the church would faithfully serve all who hunger for your divine presence. Through the work of the church, gather in with gentleness and reverence those who are spiritual orphans. Embrace them with the love of your heart. We pray especially that you would be with those newly baptized at the vigil of Easter, Angie Walburn and her sons, Tyler, Oliver, Samuel, and Theo. Lord, in your mercy, send your spirit to the leaders of the nations. The divisions would become transformed into ways of cooperation for the well-being of all people. Bring peace to the nations of the world, especially between Ukraine and Russia. Lord, in your mercy, preserve the hungry from famine. Rescue the oppressed from pain and death deliver our world from destruction. May the offerings we make to Lutheran World Relief and ELCA World Hunger Appeal go to people who might truly be helped and fed by them. Lord, in your mercy, strengthen all the ministries of this community of faith that your divine care and compassion might be made known through us. Lord, in your mercy, loving God, look gently upon the mothers of newborn and young children Give them energy, patience, gentleness, and happiness in these fleeting days. Bless mothers who are raising school-aged children and teenagers. Give them peace and joy in parenting, in moments that seem both hard and wonderful, all at the same time. Bless mothers who from afar watch and wonder about their adult children. Give them perspective and wisdom as their children make choices and live their own lives. Healing God comfort all people who mourn the absence of their mother today from death or illness or because of broken and challenging relationships. Ever-present God, embrace and comfort those mothers who mourn over the loss of their own children. Gracious God, help us to recognize all the women who have guided us and loved us as mothers, shining forth as an example of the deepness of the love you offer each of your beloved children. Lord, in your mercy, we lift up to you those whose lives are burdened by sickness, disease, and afflictions of any kind. Especially we hold before you this day Barb Hartline, Charlie Wright, Shirley Mangus, Kate Fisher, Mike Benfer, Bobby and Jeanette Calhoun, Joyce Osman, Ron Koch, Harold Raup, Frida Kiefer, Albert Mabus, Gary Fry, Barbara Mitternacht, Janice Knauer, Ron Ott, Susan Grub, Lori Yost, Kathy Hillard, Marilyn, Ronnie Johnston, Jeff Grub. Eileen Montgomery, Bob Temple, Russ Wynn, Derek Kotner, Jason Metzger, Sandy Schuyler-Fairman, Brad Lidecker, 
Julia Tebbets, Lena Murray Reed, John Greenhill, Donna Bridges, Ronna Bonnie Gottschall, Eileen Povish, George Diefenbacher, Ed Keller, Tyler Morton, Bob McMahon, Mary Betts, Sue Hummel, Keith Whitmer, Tasha, Greg Travis, Bev Stamen, John White, Karen Demian, Bonnie Stagg, Judah Rex Elkin, Emmeline Steyer, Megan Sheets, Emma Jun Valinsky, Don Castleberry, Paul Davis, Al Kaufman, Ron Brubaker, and all we name out loud before you. Bless them with your healing and, and watch over those who care for them. Lord, in your mercy, we thank you for all the saints who have been examples of worshiping and serving your reign, especially mothers of memory. Comfort the grieving and give them deep and abiding hope in the resurrection. Lord, in your mercy, and to your hands, O oh Lord, we commend all for whom we pray, trusting in your mercy through your Son, our Savior, Jesus Christ. Amen. Peace of the Lord be with you always. Let us share the peace. Let us pray. Merciful Father, everything in heaven and earth belongs to you. We grant the needs of the to us. May these gifts be signed to your glory. Return to you, dedicated to the healing and unity of all creation. Through Jesus Christ. Amen. The Lord be with you. up your hearts. Let us give thanks to the Lord our God. It is indeed right and good that we should everywhere and always offer thanks and praise to you, holy God, mighty and immortal, through 
Christ our Lord. The day of your final jubilee dawned in your Son, Jesus, your anointed one, who announced good news to the poor, bound up the brokenhearted, and set the captives free. And so with earth, sky, and sea, and all their creatures, with angels and archangels, and the whole company of heaven, we praise your name and join the run and Loving God, we praise you for creating the heavens and the earth. We bless you for bringing Noah and his family through the waters of the flood, for freeing your people Israel from the bonds of slavery, and for sending your Son to be our Redeemer. We give you thanks for Jesus, who living among us healed the sick, fed the hungry, and with a love stronger than death, gave his life for others. In the night in which he was betrayed, our Lord Jesus took bread, gave thanks, broke it, and gave it to his disciples, saying, Take and eat, this is my body given for you. Do this for the remembrance of me. And again after supper, he took the cup, gave thanks, and gave it for all to drink, saying, This cup is the new covenant in my blood, shed for you and for all people, for the forgiveness of sins. Do this for the remembrance of me. Remembering, therefore, his life-giving death and glorious resurrection, we await your promised life for all this dying world. Breathe your spirit on us and on this bread and cup. Carry us in your arms from death to life, that we may live as your chosen ones, clothed in the righteousness of Christ. Through him all honor and glory is yours, Almighty Father, with the Holy Spirit and your holy church, both now and forever. Amen. Lord, remember us in your kingdom and teach us to pray. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory, forever and ever. Amen. Behold, the Lamb of God, who takes away the sins of the world, happy are those who are called to his supper. Thanks be to God.
now and is for the summer. Come to the table for all is ready, the gifts of God for the people of God. body and blood of our Lord Jesus Christ strengthen you and keep you in his grace. Amen.
Please stand for prayer. Let us pray. Life-giving God, you have fed us with heaven's perfect food, the very presence of Christ Jesus. Send us now to be what we have received, that all creation might know your love and sing your praise now and always. Amen. Amen. Ursula and Deb are going to visit Bar Park line today, and so as I give them the elements from the table, uh, we also say this prayer. Gracious God, you took the form of a servant, offering yourself as food, comfort, and strength to a sick and hurting world. Anoint with a servant heart those who take your word and sacrament to our sister Barbara. Grant grace, mercy, healing, and hope uh, to her who feasts on your body and blood and receive your words of new life. May we all recognize that we have a place and a home in the body of our Lord Jesus Christ. Amen. May Almighty God, the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit bless you now and forever. Amen. Go in peace to love and serve the Lord. Thanks be to God. Oh, you need to stop. Thank you. Uh, we have a uh, mistake in the bulletin. The wrong hymn was put in. We sang it a couple weeks ago. And uh, so we're going to be singing hymn 463 from the Green Book today. So find a Green Book. should be somewhere in front of you. Lutheran Book of Worship. And we're looking for hymn 463. And we'll just take a moment till you find it. Hymn 463. 